It's time for another exciting adventure of Super Tesla. Do, 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 do. Oh. 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 Help me. Okay, howdy everybody and welcome back to lecture 24. Uh, today we're going to be doing chapter 26, and this is EC 2002. I'm Art Turlip. Let's get started. Today we're very excited to bring to you topic of resonance. Um, so, you know, you, you may have seen when you were younger, maybe if you took a music class, a tuning fork, right? It resonates at a particular frequency. Well, our circuits are going to do the same thing. They're going to resonate at a particular particular frequency, but what does resonance actually mean from a mathematical standpoint? Um, it's easy to say that it produces something or, or has nice effects at a certain frequency, but yeah, it's kind of superficial. So today, finally, we're going to dig into how to define this uh, for a particular system, and then we're going to extend this as we move forward to looking at the entire frequency spectrum and then being able to pick out from a lineup of frequencies and say, aha, at this particular frequency or around this particular frequency, I have very nice behavior or I'm passing that frequency or I'm uh, not allowing that frequency, I'm blocking it. Okay, so let's, let's begin with the first step on this little mini journey that we have. So a resonant circuit, what is it? Uh, it's a class of circuits which have a transfer function. You guys remember what transfer function is? This is the H of S, right? That is strongly dependent on the input or excitation frequency. So what happens here is that there's some input function XS. Well, actually, you don't even really need to worry about that. Um, you're going to put in some S into here. And there's some, some value of S that allows it to be uh, maximized. Uh, another way to look at this is the magnitude or amplitude of the output might vary greatly with small changes to frequency inputs. And we'll see what's going on there. That really depends on, on your, your kind of bandwidth of, of what's going on, but we'll get there. Okay, so chapter 10, recall there's no resistance in the circuit, okay? effectively. And we derived a second order equation for this right here. Okay. What did this tell us? Well, it told us that our lambda values are our solutions to our characteristic equation were plus minus J times this constant. And at the time we kind of just took it for granted a little bit that one over LC, the square root of one over LC was kind of this special number. Well, it's not a special number, as a matter of fact, it's a special frequency. So recall that when we had just these J solutions that we ended up with just sines and cosines added together. Um, and in this case, what's going on is we have sines and cosines added together at a particular frequency. So now, the way we're going to view this, because before we had, you know, these sines and cosines here at particular frequencies, now we're just going to kind of take this as a given and say... Um, now, you know, instead of deriving the, the O to E, we've already done the O to E bit. We've, we've seen a more practical way of examining spaces. Um, but we're going to think about it in terms of having no uh, imaginary or reactive component uh, for the impedance. Now, this is a little bit confusing. So we'll dig into what we mean exactly by um, no imaginary reactive component here uh, moving forward. But let's, let's just assume for the moment that we just have a nice sine and cosine solution for the voltage that's going on in this system. Assume that there's no resistance in here. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the Laplace domain version of this circuit. So here we have the, uh, the VNS, do this in blue. Uh, our impedance due to that inductor and our impedance due to the, capac the capacitor. Um, we have our current running through here and our big VCS off here to the side. So 
when we derive these equations for voltage, for VC, what we end up with is a voltage division problem, right? These are effectively two resistances multiplied to that input voltage. And then we can solve away. So I think the book actually has a bit of a typo in it, actually. Um, and let me explain. So ICS is actually derived as follows. Uh, we end up with this expression for it. If you're confused as to why, where that comes from, uh, what we actually are getting this from is ICS times ZLS plus ZCS, right? And effectively, this is the total resistance or impedance of the system. And then this would be equal to VNS, right? So V equals IR, effectively. In this case, IZ uh, for our, our duality equation. Um, so what we end up with then is two different versions of the transfer function, just like we have in the past. And for HIS, it starts out as IC uh, over VN. I'm sorry, IL, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, the book has it as IL. It's the same current, right? It'll be consistent, though. ILS, it's, it's the same thing either way. Um, anyways, so you end up with this expression here. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is that the uh, book, if you look here, take a look, it's in the book, um, has this expression. This is correct. Um, it's consistent with what we've derived here. Right? This is just ZL plus ZC. Yeah? Okay, but the issue is, is then the next step shows you this. And I think what's going on here is I think Tom might have accidentally switched over to the other uh, version of HS. So this is actually HI uh, of S. And then at this point here, he actually has a new... This switched over for some reason. HV of S, and he has this. So my apologies for that. I, I should have caught that. Um, but anyways, uh, if you look at this equation here, and, and you, you start to break it down, as I have done over here, um, you can simplify this to have the LC out front and 1 over S squared plus LC. This is a nicer transfer function to work with for us because it's going to really demonstrate those sines and cosines. Uh, if you can't see that yet here, you should be able to because guess what? It's right there. Um, so a couple of notes here. Uh, y in, in this case, is actually equal to uh, HIS. Why is that? No pun intended. <laughs> so HI of S is this guy right here. And so if we think about it, actually, we said that this was our total impedance of the system. So then one over that is actually the, uh, right, if I was doing this little number on it, um, then one over that would be the total admittance of the system. And so that's uh, consistent with what we see going on here. Okay. And I think that's all I wanted to say about this, this slide here. So... We'll mosey on. Okay, so now we're going to take a phaser perspective on this entire problem. And first thing we're going to do is recognize that the impedance of two series elements is equal to this. So we're, we have an input signal coming in, right? It's, it's a frequency, an input frequency. And that frequency is coming in as some kind of sine-cosine function. And the reason we write it this way is because we only care about the uh, the imaginary portion right here. Because the imaginary portion is the vibrating bit, right? It's the wibbly-wobbly bit, yeah? So that's the only thing that's vibrating at that omega, okay? That's what we really care about. Okay. We'll, we'll get more into that in a sec. So... Uh, at undamped resonance frequency, omega not equal to 1 over the square root of LC, this goes to 0 as the impedances cancel each other out. Let me prove that to you real quick. So if I have J times 1 over square root of LC times L minus 
j uh, times 1 over, and I'm going to write this upstairs, lc, it's 1 over lc for omega naught, right, uh, over c, uh, then what I have here is I just have j of, well, let's move this guy, oops, let's move this guy upstairs, right, so I have square root of lc over lc times l, right? Because 1 over lc is equivalent to this, yeah? Minus square root of lc over c. The l's cancel politely, and this cancels with this now. And so this whole expression goes to 0. So at that magic frequency, at that resonance frequency, omega naught, I end up canceling out the impedance. Okay, what does that mean? The cancellation of the impedance means that I have zero impedance and I have infinite resistance. I'm sorry, let me leave this up here. I'm, I'm backing up too far while I'm talking. That way you guys, I don't know why I'm erasing that. You guys probably want me to keep that for you. There you go. Okay, you can keep that as a present. <laughs> Anyways, um, so the resistant, oops, the impedance from your inductor and your capacitor at that frequency cancel each other out. Now remember that impedance is like this frequency duality of resistance, okay? So what we had for V equals IR in the uh, DC domain, it is effectively a DC time-based domain, right? Is its duality in the uh, frequency space is this uh, V equals IZ. And so when I cancel out all of my little impedances, I end up with a really interesting uh, equation at that point. So at this point, the output current is infinite uh, for any non-zero voltage because there's literally no resistance or impedance in that system anymore with respect to that particular frequency. And so we get something that looks like uh, infinite power here, right? Something like this. I think this is pretty accurate. Um, I don't know if you guys have done this one in the lab yet, um, to generate infinite power. Um, but you'll, you know, I think this is lab six or something. What hap what'll happen here is that right now our resonance is equal to omega naught, but as our circuit gets more complex, this is going to hold steady. And then we're going to add and do stuff to this. That's going to make omega R a little bit different. Okay. Then than what it is currently. So just know that this is a simple example, and in this simple example, this holds true, but it won't generally be true for more complicated uh, circuits. It will be down here, <laughs> but, but not for more complicated ones. Okay, so let's add a resistor to our resonance, and in this case, we're gonna use the parallel R RLC. Okay, so this should be really confusing to you if uh, you just looked at it and were like, what the heck, we're in parallel. Uh, mode now. So let's do this here. We'll draw this out. We have an impedance here, an impedance here, an impedance here. And so the admittance is just the sum of all the admittances in this case. If we set omega equal to omega naught, we end up with just omega naught equal to L sub P and C sub P, okay, and the square root thereof. Um, and so our admittance then is only the resistance that we have here or the um, impedance, um, excuse, excuse me, our admittance is only the admittance that we have here. And so we end up with um, it being maximized at om omega R, our resonance is equal to omega naught. So this is effectively an open circuit at this frequency, right? Why is this an open circuit at this frequency? Well, okay, so what if we didn't have the little RP in here, right? Then what would happen is this effectively would just be an open circuit because what ends up happening at uh, for our admittance here is that if this guy didn't exist, then there's, there's nothing uh, to tie the system together anymore. So in the parallel case, um, if I remove this element, then this is effectively an open circuit. 
right, at this frequency. So this kind of shows a duality between the behavior of these two systems. So just to recall here, um, when I had series LC, it created a uh, short circuit. And then for parallel LC, we got an open circuit, okay? Summary page for all the stuff we just did. Um, and we talked about this already. All right, so let's try to tune out a particular uh, frequency. So this guy here, <laughs> I had to put this in here because we're trying to do some tuning out, right? So this, uh, this is Timothy Leary. Uh, he's one of the biggest idiots to have ever lived on the face of the planet because he ruined research into uh, psychedelic um, substances completely by unethical research, okay? Say what you will about him. He's a terrible scientist, okay? I don't care. So, absolute moron. Here, we'll put a big dunce cap on him. There you go. Rest in peace, Timothy Leary. All right, so anyways... <laughs> He, is, he had a book or a show or something that was tune, uh, turn on, tune in, and, and, uh, and uh, drop out. We're going to actually tune out instead of tune in. So anyway, that's, that's the pun here. That, it's not very strong. This is not my strongest game, okay? We're in lecture 24. I'm running out of material. You make me dig stuff out of the freaking 60s, okay? Where, where am I supposed to go here, guys? Okay, so anyways... Um, so in this example, we have an incoming frequency in radians per second. And we're going to go through um, this capacitor and this resistor. Now, note here that we've kind of been throwing stuff around, like capacitors can pass sometimes frequency through them or uh, sometimes not. Yeah, it's kind of true. We're gonna we're going to start to define our terms for like how things can actually pass through capacitors and inductors finally, instead of just making generalized assumptions. Okay, so here we go. Our admittance for some input signal, J omega. Now recall we're using J omega because we need that sinusoidal behavior. So that's why we're using a J omega input into the system. So this is equal to our one over our resistor here, and then one over our um, our impedance here for this part, which was just um, one over S. Excuse me, one over SC. So one over one over SC is just SC, and in this case, S is just J omega. Okay, so now what we do is we uh, put in our specific value of omega, which is our input to the system, and we say, what do we get back out? Well, at point eight, uh, we calculate the phase angle to be the arctangent of three over four. Oof, where did we get that from? Um, actually, it's not too complicated. If you were to, this guy goes to one, by the way. If you were to draw this out, uh, what do you end up with? So let's go ahead and do the rectangular coordinates one more time for y'all. Um, we have on this axis 5 over 3. And on this axis we have uh, 5 over 4 on the imaginary axis, right? So we're trying to figure out um, exactly what the uh, angle is between these two. Uh, fortunately, these are nice for us, right? This is a three, four, five triangle. Um, but you could reduce this a little bit. Yeah. And effectively what it is, is, um, tangent, right? Is opposite over adjacent. So five over four over five over three. So the three swings up top and you have three over four. Okay. So yeah, that's one way to calculate it. Sure, you have other nicer ways to do it, but that's effectively what's going on. Okay, so we should be able to add the appropriate inductor to tune out that capacitor. That makes sense. 
Um, we got to get rid of that imaginary uh, component here, this part right here. So that's what we're saying when we got to get rid of the imaginary stuff. So let, let me go back here. Um, yeah, this is it. So we back here we said at resonance we wanted no imaginary or reactive component for the impedance, right? And we saw that uh, when we plugged in the right value here, these guys canceled each other out. And we saw that even in the presence of a well-placed resistor, we ended up with just a real component for the admittance or the impedance, however you want to look at it. And so we got rid of that imaginary part. Uh, similarly here, uh, what we're doing is we're getting rid of that imaginary component once more. And in order to do that, what we need to do is cancel out this capacitor. Okay, so... Um, Let's try to find that inductor that we want. So let's chuck an inductor in here. Chuck an, that sounds like a game at a carnival, doesn't it? Chuck an inductor. Um, I don't know what it would do. Probably would have something to do with magnets. So we need current and voltage in phase to maximize that power transfer. So recall that power is a combination of voltage and current uh, effectively being multiplied together, right? Um, so we need to get them in phase uh, to maximize that power transfer. So what can we do? Well, we can take this expression and then plop in our favorite inductor. Okay, so this part here is actually the resistor and the inductor kind of put together. And what we're going to do is simplify the expression just like we have in the past, except we're using... Uh, this phasor notation to kind of help us out and, and help guide us properly. Simplify this by multiplying top and bottom by the complex conjugate. And you know that when you multiply by the con complex conjugate, you get uh, these two elements, or these two terms squared with each other. Um, and so we have this on top. And we break this apart a little bit more. And we end up with a real part and an imaginary part. So we take this business here, which is all real, and we stick that up front. And then we take this business plus this business right here, because that's all imaginary. It's got that J in there, right? And the reason we did this operation from here was so that we would have a nice J in the numerator so that we could do just this. So now all we need to do is push this to zero. And that will get rid of that imaginary component for us. And what will that do? Well, think about it in the complex plane. What does that mean? So our angle here is theta, right? So as I move this back to the real axis, take us back to reality, um, and I get rid of the uh, imaginary, I get rid of the imaginary component right here I'm just on this axis and I've effectively um, maximized my power transfer by putting everything back in phase okay so let's let's do that let's solve this equation okay so this at let's see 0 0.8 uh, for Omega naught we want to get rid of this. So we have a particular frequency that we're putting in, right? That we want to work nicely with this capacitor and this inductor. And so we're given the frequency for which we want this to behave properly, for which we want it to resonate. We use L sub S here um, because it's in series with this guy here, okay? All right. So when we plug this in for, oopsies, when we plug this in for uh, our inductor, we end up with the real component of admittance is equal to this. Uh, in case you literally have taken a, no other electrical engineering <laughs> cars, uh, this is another way to write uh, admittance. This is one over omega, which I think makes more sense than Siemens. Um, but there you go. You can write it either way for, for exams and quizzes for me. I actually like this one more. 
But um, Siemens is usually used more frequently, I think. I think the real reason, honestly, this is usually Siemens is because uh, we all write too sloppy in electrical engineering, right? Some of us write way too sloppy, okay? And I've told you who you are. But um, some of us, you know, can't, can't quite make this look not like a V. And so I think that's why there's an S. <laughs> but anyways, um, all right. So then what's our uh, impedance then? It's just the reciprocal of this. And so we have maximum power transfer, but the input impedance is actually a lot higher than our actual load. What was our actual load? Let's go back and look. Oh, shoot. It's three-fifths ohms. <laughs> so we have this compared to three-fifths is what we had if we didn't have any of this nonsense going on, right? Um, so this is not, uh, this is what we would call a suboptimal uh, solution here, right? Because uh, we have to do a lot more. Uh, to get over this this hump here than we did for just this. But that's okay. We've, we've learned something in this process, right? This is about toy examples to show us what we can do for signals. So the input impedance is much higher than the actual load here. All right. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about second-order systems in the complex plane in general. And we're going to recall first what a second-order system is. We've kind of already done one today twice um but that's okay um you know we have inductor and capacitor together that's really what this is see everything you need to learn you learned in kindergarten it's true it's just like frog and toad together right you for a second order system this is all you need you need two friends that get along great they're very different from each other but they they like each other very much okay so <laughs> Losing my mind here, folks. So an undamped natural response frequency, um, omega naught, and we have a circuit state, you know, we have various circuit states. We have our undamped, underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped. And really we have, you know, our kind of wild case, which we don't really talk about too much. And then um, I guess there's also the null state right where literally nothing is happening um which is a special place in and of itself but uh but yeah so we've talked about what these are and what they imply and where they exist in the complex plane so we're going to kind of review that just a little bit and then also talk about um some other features that are in there all right so recall that this equation for our roots of our characteristic directly related to our poles for our transfer function. So this is, again, no surprise to us because we know that the characteristic equation is this linearization of the ordinary differential equation. And so when we think about poles, this is effectively thinking about things in this frequency space, which makes everything become more linear. In fact, it even gets us this dealy, which takes us to here, right? It makes things behave really nice. So no surprise that our, our poles of our transfer function are directly related to the roots of our characteristic for our RLC circuit. Okay, so recall the following. An overdamped has real poles, only real poles. A critically damped system has a double real pole, and it is negative as well, right? Oops. It is negative as well. And then uh, our underdamped system has complex conjugates of one another. So we have the real part plus an imaginary part. And this real part, as it turns out, is one over uh, negative 1 over 2RC. And then our undamped system is just purely imaginary. Um, so we just have, you know, that square root of... Uh, 1 over the square root of LC, plus minus J in front of that. All right, so if we consider a circle of radius omega naught, where omega naught is the sum of these two pieces squared, the, the real and the imaginary part, okay, um, then what we end up with 
if we rewrite this guy actually. So we want this to be equal to minus sigma p plus minus j omega d, okay? That's what we have here. So all the roots lie on this circle for the system. This is why some of our simple system, uh, why for some of our simple systems, our resonance is equal to omega naught. We'll see in the next chapter that more complicated systems have other kinds of behavior. But what is this really talking about at all anyway? Um, let's look at the PZ plot for a few of these and I'll explain there what's going on. All right, so I have a little bit of time left over after editing uh, this video. And honestly, I, I'm not too happy with like how things turned out exactly. So I want to add in just a little bit more to help clarify this idea of resonance and how we get there. Um, if we want a constant resonance frequency, what are the things that we can change in order to maintain that uh, resonance frequency? So uh, what I want to do here is uh, give you a definition. So the geometric mean of x1, x2, xn is defined as the nth root of uh, x1 times x2 times xn. Okay, compare this to uh, the arithmetic mean, um, which is a little bit different, right? You do x1 plus x2, you know, plus xn divided by n, right? And this gives you that average. But you can see the similarity here. So in this case, I'm adding everything together and, and then dividing by the number of occurrences. Um, in this case, um, well, actually, let's let's emphasize this a little bit more. There'll be a little bit of a math lesson here. So I'm adding stuff and then I'm dividing. So recall kind of our um, hierarchy of operations here, right? I have addition, then multiplication, and then uh, exponentiation. I'll just write it like this for now. Um, but effectively, what's happening here is I've taken a sum of numbers and I'm dividing them, which is the inverse of addition, and I've taken the product of numbers and then I'm taking an exponent of them. In fact, I'm taking 1 over n uh, to break them up. Um, so this is just a different way of assessing where things are and what this does for us the geometric mean is it actually measures better kind of a distance from the origin for our purposes um, and it works out really nicely so there's a there's a nice diagram on Wikipedia if you're curious more about the difference between geometric and arithmetic means um, but uh, encourage you to go look at it as usual. Um, but for our purposes, I'm just going to define it and we'll uh, use it here because we're good engineers. We don't really need to derive all the math now, do we? Okay, so we have the pole zero plot here. And at omega naught equal 10, you can see our two roots here. And our omega naught is running through the geometric average of these two. Okay, and then when our... Uh, our two things come together, right? When these two come together, they meet right at omega naught. So what are we actually shifting here uh, to make this work? Well, we're shifting around the values of R, L, and C to meet certain criteria. So as long as we maintain a constant omega naught, we can change R, L, and C around a little bit. But as long as it holds true, and in this case for the textbook, we're, we're sitting at uh, omega naught equal 10. Okay. And what we're doing is we're adjusting these two parameters until we end up with various states for our system. Okay, so our, our two poles here uh, are equal to minus sigma p plus minus j omega d, right? And so what we're doing here in this first part is we have um, this guy is equal to, is, uh, equal to zero, Effectively, underneath the original radical that we had, um, it's all positive. 
So this is zero in this first part. In the second part, shown here, we have the two poles meeting up with each other so that um, it's still real, but now it's just, um, our segment P is, is simply defined as this. And then what we have is uh, sigma P starts to shrink and omega D starts to grow. And we end up with plot three, where we have two complex conjugate roots of one another. And then by this plot here, sigma P has shrunk to zero. And we are left with just an omega D portion. But if we bound omega P and omega D by a specific omega naught, by a specific frequency, we can actually map out exactly where all of these different poles will go for different options or different behaviors that we want to exhibit for RLC combinations. So what am I trying to say here? Because this is kind of confusing. What I'm trying to say is that if I fix an omega naught, let me write it out here a little bit, I can get any of these behaviors out for a specific omega naught. So I can fix the resonance that I want and adjust the RLC values to meet these different criteria. That's the big takeaway here. And I have equations which can govern that. So in this case, I have, um, you know, I end up with two complex conjugate roots of one another, but they still create an omega, J omega D and a minus sigma P such that um, the radius, the distance from the origin for both of these uh, roots is omega naught. So they still hit that resonance. So that's where the resonance of the system lives is right along those roots. So next time what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, great, that's where the resonance lives. You know, big deal, who cares? But now what we're going to do is, I guess I didn't do a diagram for this. We're going to change the frequency, right? And we're going to look at what happens when it's a smaller frequency or what happens when I have a larger frequency. Then what? Well, it's not inside resonance anymore, but it has some behavior to it. We know where resident, uh, resonance, resonance exists, right? No matter what, when I look back at the textbook here, if my poles are here, oops, if my poles are here and here, my resonance is the geometric mean all the way around. If my pole, I have double pole, ah, it just runs right into that. If my poles are complex conjugates, it runs right into that, right? Resonance always hits right on my, my poles if it can. And as my poles become a little bit more complicated, this is the kicker that we're going to see. So let's say I had, let me, let me draw out this example actually, because this is a, a great way to really start to understand this. Um, so suppose I had then a pole here and a, and a pole here, right? It's taking this geometric mean between the two for resonance. Now you say, well, it's not actually on the poles. Well, yeah, no, it's not. But what if I had a system that had more poles than that? What if my system had a pole here, a pole here, and a pole here? You can see where the more complex system is coming into play. Where do I hate resonance? Well, maybe it's something right in here, right? Maybe it's a, a combination of these different relationships between uh, different possible values of omega naught, right? So that's where we're going to go eventually with trying to find resonance in more complicated systems. But for right now, it suffices to show that for second order systems, we're just going to hit on these. And the only time we get something goofy is when we have two on the real axis here. And next time, we're going to focus on changing that frequency. And then later on, we'll focus on changing and complicating those poles and 
uh, and even the zeros and see what happens with those. Okay. So I started doing some editing on uh, this chapter and, you know, for, for the lecture when I do the video edits, and I was really dissatisfied with how I ended things and it's, and it's kind of short. So I wanted to take a little bit of extra time here because, you know, I, I want you guys to get the most that you can out of this. I want to use the PZ plotter to really explain what's going on. Um, so we just described what the geometric mean is and its relevance here is that the geometric mean of our poles gives us the resonance. So if we hold resonance constant, then all we have to do is make sure that the geometric mean of the two poles meets that constant. In this case, we're gonna select omega naught is equal to 10, and we're going to play around with that and see what we can get back out. Now, we also have to follow the rules of complex conjugates and things like that uh, when we get into get off the real axis that's right here. So that's something to keep in mind as well as a limitation. But um, by and large, um, that's what it's going to be, is just trying to play around with numbers to get things that fit on this circle. So here in MATLAB, what I did, um, and I, this isn't in the updated this isn't updated in the script or anything. You can just make this yourself. Um, you're smart. You can do it. But this just makes a, uh, a circle plot for you. You can also use other functions and stuff. There's existing functions in MATLAB, I'm sure. But anyways, um, you can copy this if you want into your own version of the script or modify it yourself. And what this is going to do is add a little circle plot for us. And what I've done is I've created a circle of radius 10 uh, centered at the origin for X and Y. Now, this is just an overlay, right? It's not actually doing any calculations with this. It's just <laughs> plotting this up here and looking at it for you, all right? Um, so keep that in mind. Okay, so for this first problem that we have, I went ahead and took out all the zeros because I don't really care what the zeros are. Um, my example is important for looking at the poles because we said that really what's going on here is that those characteristic solutions are effectively our poles um, of our transfer function. So what we want to do is plot this guy out and see where they exist with respect to that circle. And we saw this in the book, right? Um, we have a circle of radius 10, and then we had something at negative 20 and negative 5. Now you could have just said, well, maybe, maybe you were just guessing. Like, how did you know that negative 5 and 20 would give you um, a geometric mean of 10. Well, you you can check here, right? So we do that. And I'll, yeah, you do negative 5 times negative 20. And what do you know? The answer is 10. Okay? So if we want to bring these two together, obviously 10 and 10 will work just fine too. Right? And that's our repeated root. So we're holding that radius constant and moving our poles around um, but the resonance does not change where it exists that frequency does not change where it exists okay oops I forgot to close the figure once again there we are okay so here you can see our two poles are right on that line um, more interesting however is trying to figure out what happens when I go into the uh, the complex solutions or the under damped solutions. So this one's actually pretty simple. So if we look back at the book here, I've got one here and one up here. Um, this one's roughly at what looks like eight. And why would that be? Well, uh, if you recall a nice way to get a, a good triangle out of this with a radius of 10 or a hypotenuse of 10, um, 10 is just two times five, right? So your most famous triangle should be the three, four, five triangle. So we can just extend that to a triangle of hypotenuse 10, and we'll have a side of eight and a side of six. So we have six on the real axis and eight on the imaginary axis, and that'll, that'll put us right there too. So let's go ahead and change this to reflect that. So it's minus six on the real axis, we said. I think that's what this one reflected. Uh, yeah, minus six on the on the real axis there, and we wanted uh, plus minus eight uh, j, right? Six minus eight j. Okay, let's make sure that lines up. And sure enough, it does. Um, so those are the actual 
points that we had on our on our uh, book in our textbook there. So what else could we do? Well, another nice one that we could look at right off the bat is just switching these guys around, right? It really doesn't matter. Oops. And what do you know, those two poles are on there as well. It's just a little bit different. Um, so what's the takeaway here? Well, the takeaway is that as long as the product here, I'm gonna do the square root, because we, we have two elements, right? We're taking the geometric mean of two elements, so we're taking the nth root. We have two elements, so it's the square root of these two. Let me go ahead and uh, write these in here. What do you know? It's equal to 10. So you could probably see this right away because uh, when you take the complex conjugates and you multiply them together, you just get that magnitude there, that uh, the hypotenuse of, of the two sides. So pretty easy to see that here. Nothing too crazy. And then of course if you multiply um, plus minus uh, 10 and you actually get the real the real 10 back out, right? The, the, let's do it this way. I'll just show you what I mean. So we have uh, 10j times a negative 10j. I don't know if the syntax is going to get mad at me. Yeah, there you go. So you can see here that the j's and the minus 1 work together in this one. As opposed to here, they, they cancel each other out. Um, I only have a single negative sign here, but that requires this j times j to cancel out that negative and give me a real um, value for my frequency. So for example, something that would not work is uh, 10 and minus 10, right? That's not gonna that's not gonna work, guys. Um, so we need a real valued vector going out there uh, to to represent our phenomena. So that's uh, why this is interesting here. And what is essentially going on? Well, thanks, guys. I know today's lecture has been kind of confusing. So um, you know we're at lecture 24 today. Uh, I think that puts us at a quiz tomorrow. I am not going to have this on the quiz. Um, not this section in, in any, at any rate. Um, because I want to reserve that for when we get more, more language to be able to express ourselves. Um, so actually, since I have some time, let me go over what I think is going to be on the quiz for this one. So for quiz five, I can't believe we're there already. Um, my focus will be uh, Laplace transforms of circuits. I will cover stuff with initial conditions. Okay, and inputs. Transfer functions. And maybe lightly on oops something on that ZSR and ZIR um, but not nothing nothing on on chapter 25 or 26 okay I'm gonna leave those for uh, quiz 6 and the final okay and realistically, guys, um, these two chapters aren't going to go away, and that's why I'm okay leaving them off for right now. Uh, we're going to run into these full force as we start to develop more complicated pull zero diagrams and looking at the entire frequency response, because looking at just the resonance is nice and all, but at the end of the day, yeah, that's cool, but the the frequency behavior is much more rich and interesting than, than just what happens at a specific frequency. I mean, come on. Um, you can pick that out of the lineup, the spectrum of what's going on. So focus on this stuff. Focus on um, what would be, I guess, uh, chapters 21, 22, 23, and 24. These are going to be your meat and potatoes, okay? I think 21 is that first...
Yep. Yep. These chapters will will be uh, our our quiz five. Okay. All right, everyone. Have a good uh, Thursday, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks a lot.